who wrote a lot about Jewish history and so on and so forth. Some of you have heard of him. Um, he did have a brother named Nicodemus, but they, they, that was later on, all right? And so that, that more than likely, this is not the same Nicodemus. Um, so they believe Nicodemus was an older man, and I do think there's probably uh, some, some pretty good evidence to that um, in the sense that you know, he, he, was, uh, he came to Jesus at night, um, and, and because he was older and how he refers to Jesus here uh, seems to be kind of reaching out in a sense and so just kind of some fun thoughts there but we find we come to Nicodemus also um, it was said that he was very rich and I think I, I mentioned that last week and that he um, uh, did end up becoming a pauper um, is what is what some of the historical accounts uh, say uh, concerning concerning Nicodemus but we are introduced to him in chapter 3 and verse 1, uh, Nicodemus is not mentioned anywhere outside of the Gospel of John. All right, We will see him mentioned several times uh, throughout this Gospel as we kind of work chronologically through the life of Christ, uh, but you only find him mentioned in this, in this Gospel. Um, he comes to Jesus, and in verse number 2, I, I want to point out what he says here. He, he says to him, Rabbi, he says, We know that thou art a teacher, and look what it says, Come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And so he does make some pretty strong statements. All right, he, he's, he's declaring some things that are, that are not necessarily what all of the other Pharisees believe. Now, we're going to look at, and, and I'm, going to, I'm going to jump ahead here uh, just a little bit here, but in Matthew chapter 12, and of course this takes place later on in the life of Christ. But in Matthew chapter 12, in verse number 24, and this is talking about uh, the demoniac, demoniac being healed. Uh, verse 22, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Matthew chapter 12, now verse 23. And all the people saw were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow, speaking of Christ, doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Beelzebub, the lord of the flies, some people called him the god of dung, all right? Um, uh, but that's what they attributed his works to. All right, so some of the Pharisees did not say that he was come from God. Right? Okay, so, so I, Nicodemus is saying some things here that, that I do believe um, are going to help us as we kind of go through this chapter um, and recognize some things. So, there's, so he, he's making some strong statements as far as Jesus is concerned. Now, he's not calling him Savior. Okay, he's not. All right, and I do believe later on, my opinion is that Nicodemus does become a believer, become a follower of Christ, uh, and so on. But at this point, he's not there yet. So he's come to him. He, he makes these statements. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, um, again, which is truly, truly. Um, it's really saying, it's, 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 really, it's just saying without a doubt. Undoubtedly, this is the case. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that's where we left off last week. Now, verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Now, one of the reasons we think he was older is because of that statement, all right? He's, he's an older man, and he says, what are you talking about? <laughs> all right? How, how can a man be born again when he is old. That, that doesn't make any sense. Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? And, and as I looked at this, um, I've heard some say that they believe that Nicodemus was being somewhat facetious or condescending. I do not believe that to be the case at all because of what verse 2 says. I do believe what he's saying here is sincere. And I, I want you to take your Bibles and go with me to 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. And I, don't, and I want to say this right, but I think one of the problems with this chapter sometimes is it's become so familiar. I don't, I don't think we consider some of this stuff. And, and, and you know, don't, don't ever become so guilty where you, certain parts of Scripture become so familiar that they just, we, we, we rush over them. Um, the familiar parts of Scripture should probably be the most precious to us. Uh, in my, you know, just again, my opinion. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now, Jesus is going to talk about this in just a moment. 
for they are foolishness unto him. Isn't that a statement? So the natural man, the carnal man, the human man, cannot receive, this, uh, 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 receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are, look what the last two words are, they are what? Spiritually discerned. So uh, every time I read that, I think, Nicodemus, what's wrong with you? You know, what is your problem? This is so simple. Of course you have to be born again. How is this, you know, why would this be news to you? Now, understand, okay, this is the new covenant, all right? Jesus Christ coming, all right? Um, this, is, this is a new concept, so to speak. Um, but, but let me say some things. If we're not careful, we can take for granted what we have received. I'm very blessed, okay? I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up around the sound of the gospel. That's a, so to me, all right, Having someone say, you must be born again? I know exactly what you're talking about. Folks, can I tell you, there are people that are your neighbors, that are your coworkers, that are your friends, who when you talk to them about being born again, it is a foreign concept. They're a Christian, but they are not born again. Okay? <laughs> All right? You know, are you a Christian? Of course I'm a Christian. And then they fill it in the blank by saying, well, I'm a Lutheran, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, whatever. Of course I am. Why would I not be a Christian? That's insane. All right? Um, but, but, but there are people in this room, and, and, and Mom, your testimony, you grew up in a Lutheran church, um, grew up, quite frankly, to some degree, under the sound of the gospel. They talked about Jesus being born of a virgin, living a sinless life, dying a sacrificial death, buried, bar, buried, borrowed in a borrowed tomb, or buried in a borrowed tomb and rising, but they never did anything with it. They never took... And there are people here tonight who would say... Yeah, I, I knew about Jesus, but I never was confronted with the gospel. I never was told that I had to do anything with it. Well, Jesus said you, you got to be born again. And so be very careful, because again, I'm, I am born again. got saved at the age of nine. I've grown around, up around this my entire life. Not everybody else has. And so they hear this and they say, <laughs> You're weird. You're one of those fanatic people that says you got to be, come on now. I mean, seriously, that, that's a little extreme. And Nicodemus, to some extent, okay, this, this went against his religion. Okay, you don't, you know, again, folks, there's religions in, in, in North America today. Being born again goes against their religion. Oh, you were saved as an infant. What? Born again? What? No, I'm fine. I was I I went through catechism or I, I was confirmed. What are you talking about? And so understand where Nicodemus, when he asked this, you know, I I look at it and say, dude, what is wrong with how dumb are you? You know, you're yeah, a spiritual religious guy, you're an idiot. But hold on a second. This this goes on to this day. This is not, and so, so be, be careful with it. And I think if we're not careful, we can just assume that everybody comprehends this. They don't. They really don't. And so um, being born again is confounding to those who aren't. <laughs> okay? This is, this is a new concept. You know, I, again, I've had people, and they, I, I won't give you her name, but this came to our church one of the first times she came. She looked at, at, at the person who was sitting next to her that had brought her to church and said, I've never done this before. It was a simple message about salvation. She trusted Christ later that day. Praise God, all right? But, so I believe Nicodemus' question was sincere since he had already confessed that Jesus was a teacher who has come from God and so on. And so um, he just says, I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're saying. I, you know, I, uh, how, how can I be born again? I'm old. I, I'm, I'm supposed to crawl, crawl into my mother's womb. That, that doesn't make sense. Jim? Yes. Yes. Yeah, oh yeah, no brother. Jesus got right to the matter at, at hand. I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't pause. <laughs> you know, he just buried, he buried it. All right, he really did. Now, verse 5, Jesus answered. Okay, he responds to the question that was asked of him. Verily, verily. Again, we, it just, just, he keeps coming back to that statement. He's, he's making an emphasis here, all right? He's saying, Nicodemus, come on, you got to get this. I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. All right, Jesus is talking about uh, the, the new birth. He's talking about being born again. And he makes a statement here, being born of water and of the Spirit. Now, there has been a lot of debate over born of water and of Spirit. I, I don't think the debate is as... as um, 
cloudy as we make it, all right? Um, there are some religions who try to make that baptism. That is not baptism in any way, shape, or form, all right? Um, some, some people talk about when others were uh, proselytized from being a Gentile to Judaism, they would be baptized in a manner. Some of them talk about it being spiritual cleansing. Very simply, I think born of water refers to nothing more than the natural birth, natural childbirth. And I'll tell you why I think that, because of verse 6. It says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is is spirit. Now, I think there is some, you know, some other applications or maybe some spiritualizing that can go on, but I, I think pretty simply, the Bible kind of defines itself there. It's just talking about, he's talking about being born again. Nicodemus is asked, am I supposed to crawl into my mother's womb and be born again? What are you talking about? How can I do this when I'm, when I, when I, you know, when I'm old? And Jesus says, here's the deal. You have to be born again. You have to be born again. You got to be worn of the water, and so of course, uh, you know, um, <laughs> when a lady's water water breaks, it's time to have a child. Okay, all right. That's the one thing I've had three children. That's the one thing I have learned. All right, when when the water breaks, get her to the doctor. All right, time to go to the hospital. All right, because I'm not going any further than that. So, and so just and I, and I will point this out. Um, let's do me a favor. Jump over to Titus in chapter three. So I have to be born of the water and then born of the spirit. And, and there are some interesting allusions made um, as far as, you know, uh, being born of the spirit is concerned. Titus in chapter 3, verse number 5. The Bible says this, it says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, clearly, that's the spirit. Okay, but the Spirit of God is the one that quickens us, that makes us alive. It's the one that washes us and regenerates us, all right? And so it's not, again, it's not talking about the waters of baptism in any way, shape, or form. And just be aware of that because there are those who have tried to pull that in, and it does not, it does not compute, all right? It just does not, and even in the context, I don't believe it fits at all. But, um, and just let me make this, a couple things here, but water could never and will never wash away our sins, Please know that. And I, I, take your Bibles with me to Mark in chapter 16. There's a couple of verses that um, I have had, uh, I guess you could say, I've been confronted with um, by those who believe that um, baptism can save. Um, and I will tell you this too. One of the things that's frustrating for me is the word uh, uh, baptism um, means to immerse. Um, it's literally, the, the Greek word for baptism is baptizo, all right, which, it's, that's a tough one, that's a big, you know, that's a hard, that's, so we, literally, that's how we, we got it into our English language, there's almost no change, um, and a lot of religions today do not practice immersion, which is the definition of baptism, okay, they, they practice sprinkling, which by the very definition of the word is not baptism, I'm not trying to be mean or ugly with this stuff. I'm not. I'm just, we, folks, one of the problems in our, in our culture today is we are letting the wicked and the godless define terminology. It drives me insane. Okay, I'm so tired of, you know, again, I was, I was talking with Carl before the service tonight, and, you know, like, you know, I, I, our new president, you know, talking about one of the greatest dangers in America today is white supremacy, it's like, oh my word, you know, I mean, just because you're white, you're, 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 you're the problem. And it's like, dude, shut up. You know, number one, you're white, you know, I mean, you know, shocker. But it just bothers me, you know, and so in that sense, I agree with him. He is one of the biggest, but, you know, I'll be careful, all right? But it, amen, all right. But it frustrates me because we've allowed terminology to be redefined. That's really unhealthy, now, I understand we need to be wise and we need to be able to refute the world. Um, and so, so understanding sometimes they're going to use certain terminology and I have to be able to combat that properly. And so I, I have to maybe uh, uh, be a little bit sharper than they are in this area. But when it comes to matters of Christianity, I, I cannot allow, you know, so when people say, well, you know, I, I, was, I was baptized as an infant. You weren't baptized. I'm not going to lie to you, all right? It wasn't baptism. By the very definition of the word. And so, but Mark chapter 16, I'll get off my soapbox. And uh, verse 15, and said unto them, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We call that what? What is that called? Great commission. All right, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
Now, I've had that quoted to me many times by uh, Protestants or Catholics, okay? They never finish the verse. But he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. Is that what it says? What does it say? He that believeth not shall be damned. People can be saved without being baptized. Okay, I know one for sure, and that would be the thief on the cross. He did not get baptized. It was physically impossible. It was. But by Jesus' own admission, he was with him today in paradise. Correct? Okay, so I know that a person can be saved without the waters of baptism. They can, and so comprehending this, a person that is saved should get baptized. I'm going to say that to you, all right? If you're not scripturally baptized, you ought to be. If you, if you claim Christ, you're born again, you should be baptized. But the thing that's going to condemn you is not believing. And so Mark chapter 16, verse 16, so when somebody quotes that to you, so, well, you, you, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, that's true. That's true. And if you're, if you're born again, you believed, and you should be baptized. But the thing that will condemn you is not, has nothing to do with baptism. Amen. It has to do with not believing. And I'll jump, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. And, um, and so, I, again, I think Mark 16 really, if you just read the whole verse, it's pretty easy to... Um, and, and I will say this, um, you know, uh, Brother Tim Kozlowski, you know, Brother, we, we went and visited uh, uh, Sherry Lawson's husband, Ken, and he'd quote that verse, um, uh, Brother Moore, um, he'd quote that verse to us and just, uh, you know, it, it, you know he, it, the first part, first part. And I finally, I, don't, I, don't, I think maybe it was with you, Brother John, and I said, Ken, what's the rest of the verse say? He had no idea because <laughs> it didn't fit his theology, you know, so if it doesn't fit your theology or your agenda, don't use it. And that's, that's a horrible way to live. That's not truth. That's, that's, that's being blind. But 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, and, and Ken did trust Christ right at the end, and praise God for that. But 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, which sometime, uh, verse 20, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Now just, you know, okay, we're using... In illustration here, Noah and his sons were not saved by water in the sense of baptism. Okay? Verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism, so, so again, it's, it's, this is an illustration, the like figure, all right, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, in parentheses, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, and looking, going back to Titus in chapter 3, we're, we're washed and saved by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But by the answer of a good conscience towards God by the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism gives me a good conscience. It does not put away the filth of the flesh. So understand, again, again when you read it in its proper context, I don't think it's that hard to understand what it's saying. It's saying the ark, when God sent the flood, the ark floated above the water, and they were saved. Okay, and in a similar manner, baptism, all right, doesn't put away the filth of the flesh, but it does give me a good conscience towards God in the sense that I'm saying, hey, here's the deal. Outwardly, I am obeying Christ as Noah and his sons did. Okay, and so I'm just being aware of that. And I've, I've had those verses thrown at me, and I, maybe I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but I don't think not, I am very much at all. It's pretty simple. Just read, read the entire text. Okay, just, just put it in its proper context and walk through it. And it's really not that confusing, although some try to make it that way. So, um, so when we go, again, going back to John in chapter 3, being bored of the water and of the Spirit, one is physical, all right, which is just answering Nicodemus's question. The second is spiritual, all right? In verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Verse 7, all right, the Bible says this, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again, all right? Jesus, it just kind of entertains me, but he's saying, don't be surprised at this. Don't be shocked. 
don't, don't be amazed, don't marvel, all right? He must be born again. Now, Jesus keeps coming after this, by the way. And folks, I will tell you this. This is something that we ought to also take from Christ here. This is something that is so important. He must be born again. Someone's salvation is of the utmost importance. Our religious conversations do tend to be distracted from that. Until a person is willing to give you a testimony of salvation, you got to be a little bit of a bulldog, all right? Jesus was. He just kept coming back. Nicodemus, Nicodemus, Nicodemus. They could have discussed the entire Old Testament. Okay, Jesus was the literal word. Nicodemus was very learned in the Old Testament. They could have had many religious discussions concerning that. Jesus said, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. All right. Um, Nicodemus, based on who he thought he was, had no need of divine help. He was religious, and according to his religion, He was a good man. Therefore, he had no need of redemption. Please comprehend that. Jesus said, Nicodemus, don't marvel not. Marvel not. He said, you've got to be born again. I'm not asking you, are you a Jew? I'm not asking you, are you a believer? I'm not asking you, are you a Christian? I'm not trying to use the vernacular of the day. I'm saying, are you born again? It's such a basic, it's it's almost a... a, 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 it's, it's putting it on the lowest shelf and just saying, dude, either you are or you aren't. What are you? And, Nic- and this is where it, it, I, I think it really hit Nicodemus because Nic- Nicodemus was challenged with this. He said, I don't need redemption. I don't need salvation. <laughs> I, I'm a good man. Check my religion. Right? And folks, that's our problem because independent of Christ... Independent of the gospel, man is on his own, and man convinces himself he's good. Brother Jim? Yes. No, brother, I don't, and I think, again, this is where religion has done such a horrible job at muddying the waters. Yeah. Right. No, and I think, uh, you know, what Jim's saying there is so true, and so, so much of, again, religion day has complicated and, and, and muddied the waters where Christ broke it down and made it very, very simple that, again, even a child could comprehend it. Yes, and that's going back to 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. And, and so the Bible says this, and so um, uh, it helped me out. Romans ten seventeen. so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God is accompanied by the Holy Spirit, okay? And so as the gospel is presented, the word of God is presented, the Holy Spirit is attached to that, all right? And as the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit convicts, take your Bibles to John. Uh, Carl, we're, we were looking at this tonight. John, is it 14 or 15? 14. All right, John chapter 14, and uh, I'm sorry, John chapter 16. Yeah, we were right here tonight. So John chapter 16, verse number 7, okay, talking about the Holy Spirit. It says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. That's a terrible thing, isn't it? It's talking about Jesus. He says, this is a really good thing for you that I'm going away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. All right? So here's the deal. As the word of God goes forth, he does three things. All right? The Holy Spirit comes along with that. And he reproves the world of sin, all right? He reproves the world of righteousness, and he reproves the world of judgment. Now, one of the saddest things in the United States of America today is we've, re- we've removed the word of God. So we don't have this being taught to our culture anymore. And that's why our culture has rejected truth. Because all truth is ultimately based on Scripture. 
on God. God. God is truth. God is light. All right? And so as we've rejected that, we've moved further and further and further away. And I, again, I don't want to go politics here tonight, but, but our, our culture, it's, but it's very evident. All right? It really is. So this, but so the Holy Spirit convicts us of that, and, and he comes along with the truth. And so when we don't have the Word of God, we don't have the Holy Spirit the way that we need him. All right? And so he'll always, he'll always um, use that in that sense. And so being aware of that, and so these um, unbelievers and biblical, biblically illiterate people cannot comprehend spiritual matters. They can't. Um, you get into this stuff today, what's going on, and, and as a Christian, I don't know what you do except just nod your head and go, oh my. <laughs> it's, it's mind-boggling. It's, you, you do, you just want to throw your hands up and say, are, are you dumb? And, and here's the problem. The better way to say, are you ignorant? And, and the answer is, yes, they are. They are. I think what's harder to make, though, is people who do profess. Yeah. But Angie, and again, if you just pull this thing back 2,000 years ago, this is what the Jews were doing. Yeah. You know who they were? Believers in the Messiah. Just ask them. Yep, Jesus is right there. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. <laughs> All right. Yep. We are for the Messiah. Yeah, here Jesus. He just said he is the Messiah. He's proved it, and you don't want him. That's what's, that's what's going on today, is, is we, are, we are Christians, and that term is, and there's, it's not a bad term, all right? I love the term Christian. I am a Christian, all right? But the term has become anybody's a Christian today. You know, well, I own a Bible, so I'm a Christian. I went to church when I was eight years old. I haven't been back since, but I'm a Christian. No, you're not, all right? What does the term Christian mean? I don't know, but I am one. And, and I'm not trying to be facetious here. That's the truth, all right? And so comprehending these things and understanding, so I agree with you, but that's very similar to what was going on when Jesus came. And so this is not a new concept. It's frustrating because we look at it and say, guys, you're blind, you're blind. How can you justify this or how can you allow this? How can you go with this? This is wrong. But they're not born again. And so because of that, they cannot spiritually discern. And 1 Corinthians 2 does talk more about this. If you get a chance to read through that, it's really a helpful passage as far as dealing with the unbelievers. And Because you, you do. Sometimes you just look at them and you're like, I have no idea what to say to you. you know, and so that's where just give them the truth, give them the gospel, be patient, understand they don't understand. And so they have to be presented with truth. And by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit will prick their heart. And give them those three things that we see in John chapter 16. What's up, Wojo? Uh, sure. And this is, okay, it's not my way or your way, it's the Lord's way. And that's something that we have to emphasize. And that's, again, Christ, all right? We have to bring it back to the scriptures, and that's what isn't very important. And so having those scriptures, because at the end of the day, it's not the Baptist way versus their way. It's the truth. Amen. The old, Jesus said, I am the way, <laughs> all right? And so praise God for that. But that's the hard thing is so many religions don't want the book. And so we, we have to be careful of that. We really, we have to be. And so I'm um, just being aware of that. But again, looking at that, Nicodemus, Jesus said, Nicodemus, marvel not. Okay. And so based on who he thought he was, he had no need of divine help. That's a terrifying thought, but there's a lot of people today who are, and here's the thing, they're going to split hell wide open because they're fine. That's it. They're good. Just ask them. You know, Brother Tim, I think you, you know, you, you, I think you, the statement you use is even a good man needs to be saved or something along those lines you, in your testimony. And, and once we are faced with the truth, we're no longer good. 
my religion, which I can be justified as good, breaks down in the light of the gospel and the light of truth. And so being aware of that, um, so again, Jesus coming back to that marvel not. Verse 8, um, he, he, beautiful verse here in John in chapter 3, talks about uh, just, just the mysteriousness of it. In John in chapter 3 and verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And so just the new birth is miraculous. Um, and I will say this, to some extent, I, and it's somewhat at times difficult to adequately explain. All right, I'm born again tonight. How do I know that? The Holy Spirit of God indwells me. All right? Where did, where, where did the wind come from? I don't know. But I felt it. Where'd it go? Not real sure. <laughs> but I have it. And so understanding that, um, I can't see the wind, but I do feel it, so it is with the Holy Spirit. And so Nicodemus in verse number 9 answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Um, Nicodemus was so taken back by this teaching, it shook him because it was not what he wanted to hear. And Jesus did not come to tickle men's ears. He came to, he came to give them truth. And, and it, it, by the way, verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verse 11, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. And kind of talking about what we were just speaking of, all right, is what verse, verse uh, uh, 11 is, is dealing with there. But um, Jesus was shocked at this man's... Uh, Ignorance of the truth. And I, and I think here I th could also interject, I think stubbornness. Um, we like to hold on to our, our ideals, even if they'll condemn us. Folks, there's going to be a lot of people that go to hell that knew the truth. Consider the context there are going to be Pharisees that were willing to die for Israel, fighting for their cause, who literally saw Jesus and said, he does what he does by Beelzebub. Who are willing to die for Israel. Please. There are people in America today who believe in, in, in justice and liberty and freedom and fairness and equity who will die and go to hell because they reject Christ. Just, <laughs> they're Nicodemus. How can these things be? What are you, what are you saying? This is, this, is, this is absurd. And that's the scary thing, folks. Again, consider who Nicodemus was. He wasn't the drunk at the local tavern. This was a learned spiritual man who by all in all honesty, I think he was very understanding of the truth of Scripture. And yet Christ, it didn't fit. It. And so, um, but let, let's take time for just a couple questions here. We're finishing up here before we kind of shift gears a little bit. Maxine? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, huh. Here's the thing, though. He didn't get, he, he wasn't greeted with what he wanted. And that's okay. That's okay. That's what the gospel does. The gospel shakes you. All right? And so, again, we, you know, you get people who hint around at things, and they're searching. They just, you know, but when you give them the truth, sometimes they, they back off and say, whoa, you know, that's, <laughs> that's not for me. And that's okay. Jim? Why do you think they went about this in such a way? Jim, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it, it, it's fun to consider, um, you know, why they did or they didn't. Um, but I, as far as having a concrete answer, I, I don't have one for you. It's very important. Yeah, it is. Number they all you'll see the gospel given in all of them clearly. I mean, clearly, it's just just again insightful that this seems to be the first uh, chronologically discourse on the gospel um, where it really fleshes it out and where Jesus hammers it and he hammers it right from the get go. So that's that's beautiful. So doesn't hint around at things at all. If, if you get a chance, and I will tell you this, reading some of the, like, so many of the great theologians, John 3, just 
they, they just delight in it. Um, Martin Luther just loved John in chapter three. I mean, he just, it was, it was John three sixteen was just incredible. I mean, and so some of these men just delighted in this passage of scripture and it really is beautiful. It's so powerful. And there's many of you in here tonight, you got saved because of John three sixteen, you know, and that was the verse that, that triggered it and brought you to Christ.